It was a young man named Jose. He lived in a small village outside of Mexico City in a very rural jungle area. From time to time, missionaries would come to the village and Jose would get bits and pieces of knowledge about something called the New York Yankees. He began to assemble all the information he could and he became an incredible New York Yankees fan. So much so that the villagers realized that his heart's desire and number one goal of his life was to attend the World Series in New York City and watch in person the New York Yankees play. They so saw that desire in Jose, some people sold their own possessions, they made arts and crafts to sell in the marketplace in town, they cut lawns, they did whatever they could to raise the money for Jose to get to New York. And sure enough, they did. Jose flew into LaGuardia, took what little cash he had left, went to Yankee Stadium, and took all that he had on top of that, and he put it on the ticket counter, and he looked up at the man and he says, I'm here for a ticket to the World Series. Well, the man said, the young man, he said, I'm so sorry, he said, we are totally sold out and have been for many months. This is a concept Jose had no knowledge of. He says, the best I can do for you right now is maybe you can walk up and down the sidewalk and just listen to the game outside the stadium. Well, Jose had traveled so far and his villagers had raised all that money. There's no way he could be satisfied with that. No way he could go back home and report that he walked outside the stadium on the sidewalk for all of their effort. And he began to weep. And the man selling the tickets looked at the young boy and he said, I'll tell you what, son, I've never done this before, but in your particular situation, I'll do this for you. We have one seat left. We'd like very much for you to shimmy up the flagpole and sit on the gold ball in center field. Jose was elated. He'd climbed trees all the time in Mexico, outside of Mexico City. So that's sure enough, as the first pitch was about to be pitched, Jose shimmied up the flagpole. He's standing on and sitting on now that little gold ball at the top. Every person, he couldn't believe this, every person in the stadium stood on their seat, to their feet. They looked up at him on the flagpole. They put their hands over their chest and said, Jose, can you see? There is a vast difference. There is a vast difference between being outside the stadium and being inside the stadium. There is an incredible difference between window shopping, and walking into a store and purchasing a brand new coat. I was uh, in Main Street yesterday, kind of incognito, watching one of our young men who's here this morning with his date, and it was cute. Sammy, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> this kid must really like the girl sitting next to him because no man on earth would do this unless he did like her. He had an umbrella in his hand, and for every store that he went to, he parked that umbrella outside the store and escorted his friend inside, and they were just window shopping and going from store to store. Now, no man does that. That's ridiculous. You, he must really like you. In fact, I know he likes you, because he would never do that. But there is a vast difference between window shopping and walking into a store. There is a huge difference between being at a website and being in a website. If I go to my banking website and fail to remember the password and the username that I often forget, and I can't get into my bank's website to make transfers or pay bills, I might be at the website, but I'm not in the website. In the website, I can do things. I can conduct business. I can pay bills. I can check balances. I can do a lot of things. There's a vast difference between being at a church and being in a church. There's a vast difference between singing a song to the Lord and worshiping the Lord. These things are vastly different. What I'm about to share with you this morning, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is extremely important. Extremely important. It not only will change your life, it will, my friend, impart to you life. 
if you not only heed what is said here today, but you put it into practice. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Teenagers, young people, college students, I'm going to afford you the opportunity today to hear something and act upon it that will change the course of your life. Not unlike a young person who invests money in retirement in age 20, 21, 22, they end up being very rich people in old age because they understand the time value of money. Well, it's very hard to teach an old dog new tricks. If you can incorporate this, young people, into your lives now, it will yield for you incredible dividends in the future. In terms of your marriage, your personal walk, your business, the quality of life that you live, if you take what I give you this morning and you put it into practice, it will change your life and it will be an impartation of life to you for the rest of your life. Okay, first, a little brief theology lesson. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't realize this, but each and every person within the sound of my voice, in Greek thinking, in Greek understanding, and in Greek theological understanding, and according to the Apostle Paul, is divided up into three parts. If you want to understand a person, you want to understand yourself, look at yourself as divided into three sections. It'll help you to understand why you do what you do, why you don't do what you want to do, and why you do what you don't want to do. The first of which is your spirit. Now, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord, your spirit is dormant, it's dead. There's nothing going on there. The spirit is the place that you commune in fellowship with God. It's where you hear that still small voice. It's where you have a motivation to do things that you never knew you wanted to do before. It's what comes alive when you accept Christ. If you never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, your spirit is dead. It's waiting there, sitting there waiting to come alive by acknowledging him as Lord. And your communion with God, your fellowship with God, it's not really what you think it is. It's, there's much more there. You may think you have some sort of relationship with God, but he's waiting for you to accept his son so he can be your friend. So that's your spirit. Immediately when you accept Christ, it's regenerated. Boom, it's alive. If you've never accepted him, you've never been born again, then it's dead. You may think it's alive, but it's dead. It's dead. Okay, the second thing is your soul. Your soul is basically your mind, your will, and your emotions. What you think, what you drive yourself to do or not do, or avoid or not avoid, and how you feel. Powerful, isn't it? Mind, will, and emotions. Very powerful thing. And the third part of us, if we want to understand who you are, is your body and your flesh. The desires of your flesh, the cravings of your body, sexuality, uh, laziness, idleness, all of that, lack of self-discipline, Letting your body rule over you, hunger. This is where, this is where you put on uh, weight. This is where you don't put on weight. This is where you exercise, don't exercise. It's your flesh, it's your body telling you what you're gonna do in life. So you got a spirit, you got a soul, and you have a body. And you have, biblically speaking, something called the inner man, or what's called the inner woman, for simplicity's sake. Let me read this verse to you, Ephesians 3, 14 through 16. You gotta get in touch with what this is about. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. To strengthen your inner person, your spirit, the place where Christ lives and tabernacles with you. The place from which you make decisions and desires and passions and worship. Paul's saying, I want God to strengthen that part of you. Because typically what happens is we're ruled by these other parts of our life. Now listen what happens when your inner man or inner woman is strengthened. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend in other words, if your inner man isn't, isn't bolstered by God, isn't, 
isn't fanned by God, isn't strengthened by God, you're gonna have a lack of comprehension for something. You're gonna have a lack of comprehension of the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. There is a difference between being at a stadium and being in a stadium. Being in a stadium, you see the game, you experience the game, you experience the people experiencing the game, you smell hot dogs, you yell, you scream, you dance, you cheer, you boo. You encounter the fullness of the experience inside the stadium. There's a place you can go inside of Christ and Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1 and 27, that gives you a whole new experience and understanding of what it means to be a Christian, a follower, a disciple of Christ that is so much different than looking in from the perimeter. Vastly different. There's a difference between being present at church and being in his presence. There is a differentiation that must be acknowledged and experienced if you want a fullness of the abundant life that Christ promises. Experiencing a relationship with the Lord can take place more with or exclusively with one's soul. All right, what do I mean by that? You can live your entire life, and perhaps that's a possibility. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for, since you're 20 and you're 60. For 40 years, you can actually carry on a relationship with Christ that is more with your soul or exclusively with your soul and think that that is what Christ, walking with Christ looks like and feels like. It can ha- you can have a, a, a great knowledge of the Bible. That's your mind. You can have a great, you can, you can read commentaries. You can, you can know the scripture. You can know the ins and outs of the scripture. You can know Greek and Hebrew. You can interact with God on a knowledge level. You can will yourself to do things on your own not by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some people can feel their way through a Christian experience. Entire denominations are set up that are rooted and established in more emotionalism than emotion. There's nothing wrong with emotion in worship, but emotionalism will bring you to a place of emptiness and less thanness and a lack of comprehension of the height and width, the depth and the breadth of the love of Christ. You can actually think your way through a relationship with Christ and come to the end of your life, have a funeral, and look back and see that you thought your way through a relationship. Question, do your relationships in your life exist more in the soul level or a spirit level? Your horizontal relationships are an indication of your vertical relationship. You can have a soulish Christianity. And you wanna use your soul, you wanna, you wanna have knowledge of the scripture and you wanna have the mind of Christ and you wanna you have the will of God to be your will. That's, that's what we want. But when it's exclusive, it gets very dangerous because it's much more shallow and hollow than we actually want. What I'm here today to tell you is how you can access the inner man in your relationship with Christ more so than your soul. Your relationship with Jesus Christ could take place more with or exclusively with one's flesh. What do I mean by that? It's hard to explain, but it's very important. I don't know if you've ever been on a retreat or you've been in an environment where there's worship going on for like a week, maybe a revival sometime in your life, you know, an old-fashioned revival, a tent revival, something like that. All right, you probably experienced something like this. When the revival starts, on the first day, the first worship experience, you're sort of into it, you know, it's okay. But then you begin to see what God's doing. You begin to put the pieces together. And over a two or three day period of time, you find yourself coming back for worship, and then back for worship, and then back for worship. And you find yourself at a point where you've reached a, like, I'm not really sure I wanna do this anymore. And you realize that exercising your spirit is like exercising your body. And you realize that when you begin to sing songs and worship him, you didn't really mean it at the first start of of the third time you did it. The first, you started, you really weren't into it, and then you realize something opened up. And now you're immersed and lost in worship. There is a difference between worshiping in the flesh 
and worshiping in the spirit. Jesus said in John chapter four, those who worship me will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You can actually come to church, sing songs in the flesh, in your mind, with your emotions, and never encounter what God had for you in that worship experience. Does that make sense to you? It's very important. You could be doing this every single time you worship and not realize it, and that's why this is important today that you listen to what I have to say. There is a place you can go in worship. It's like when you open the Bible and you start reading. I don't really feel like worship, uh, reading the Bible today. I'm doing it because I said I would, and I'm doing it because that goofy pastor of mine put this uh, reading program together for an entire year. That's why I'm doing it. And you start to read, and you open it up, and you start to read, and then all of a sudden, about five minutes into it, you realize, wow, I hadn't saw that before. Well, that's interesting. And now it's not about finishing the task. You actually find yourself looking elsewhere in the scripture to find out a greater clarification of what you started reading. You've transitioned from the flesh to the spirit. You see that? It happens in a worship service. You, you, you step out of the world, and this is big on Wednesday nights. You step out of your job, and literally out of the car from your workplace and the stress there. You step, step into a worship service on a Wednesday night and have some food, and you're, you're distracted. You're not where you need to be. You're not postured to receive nor to give to God. You're in the flesh. That's your body. And you have to exercise that and dis discipline that part of you to press in so that now you're connecting with God on a spiritual level. This happens every Sunday we come together. It happens every time you go to the Lord in prayer. You can pray an entire prayer for 20 minutes at the side of your bed and never get beyond the flesh. It's true. It could just be a mental thing, an emotional thing. But the heart cry, the runway where you take off and you begin to fellowship with God. People live their entire lives in the flesh when it comes to Christ. Some people accept Christ and then continue to live on that level. And he really doesn't have a profound effect in your life. He doesn't have the influence he wants to have because there's a lack of this access. You're at the website, but you're not in it. You're at the stadium, but you're not in the game. Now this happens to all of us on and off, but I'm talking about a lifestyle. I'm talking about checking up today and taking inventory of are you relating to what I'm saying here because what I'm saying here is in parallel with the scripture and what the scripture has for you and I both is a strengthening of our inner man to comprehend how high, wide, long, and deep is the love of Christ that'll abandon us to a liberty and a freedom to share and to fellowship with him in ways that are far beyond my flesh, my desires, my laziness, my idleness, my desire level, my will, my how I feel about it, don't feel about it, and what I think and don't think about it. Because when you enter into worshiping in spirit and in truth, all of those things about my energy level, my distraction level, my attentiveness, all go by the wayside and the spirit man comes alive. The spirit man comes alive and now you're in a flow of grace. Talking about highly spiritual things here because we're highly spiritual people. We don't tap, on, tap into this long and often enough. There is a fellowship, there is a camaraderie, there is a friendship that exists between you and God. We have to access that spirit, man, and that stay on the surface of the water. That's it. And, that, and, and why do I bring this up at Christmas time? Why start a series called Carols in the Key of Life? Why do that? Because Christmas time, more than any other time, is the time when we sing the most, but we enter in the least. And it's because of tradition familiarity, repetitiveness of songs that we sing at the same time every year and lull us into a sense of some sort of emotional bond at Christmas time, which is fun, an intellectual reminiscing of years gone by, which is great, we want that. But rarely do we see Christmas time, and I don't like preaching at Christmas time because I'm fighting against this traditional rigmarole that I celebrate and I enjoy I hear the songs on TV and I watch the same movies and I've seen them a million times and it brings me back to my grandmother's house and, it, and the gifts that we opened and the gifts that we gave and it's nostalgic and I like that and it's good for me to do that. It keeps me rooted in my history. But rarely do I see Christmas time as that interaction, intimate connection in my spirit man with God. In fact, I think we table that for January and we call it a fast. It's interesting 
We can, in a relationship with God, we could be even more me, have a more meaningful friendship between the inner man or inner woman in Christ through the Holy Spirit. It's there for us. We spend our lives trying not to do things we want to do. And as I said last week, we tell our teenagers what they can't do, what they shouldn't do, who they need to avoid. We tell one another what we should be doing and what we could be doing and what we ought to be doing. But we focus on the behavior and not the root of a behavior, an intimate abandonment, connectedness with God that will drive and override my will, my emotions, and my thoughts. That my inner man, and Jesus said this, he said, out of you will flow rivers of living water. Said another way, you'll not be influenced and conformed to the pattern of this world like a pawn on a chessboard moved at someone else's expense by your own flesh, your own desires, your own thoughts, your own opinions, your own doctrine, your own theology. It's very soulish to have a theology that will tell God what he can and cannot do and it exists in the mind. I'll not do that. I take the Bible for what it says and anything he does in there, he can do in here. I don't have that luxury, maybe you do. I can't think God into doing certain things and think of out of doing others because that myself would make me God. And we all know that's not the case. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. All right. Well, how do you get there? What's that about? Sounds good. How do I do it? Well, I'm of the mindset, as I look through the Scripture, that there is a key that unlocks a door to a new chamber of experience and love and compassion and liberty and freedom in Christ. Sometimes the hinges get rusty because the door's not opened enough. But it is beyond what we think, beyond what we feel, beyond what we will, and beyond what our body wants. It is a place of authority. It is a place of freedom. And I believe the key that goes in the door is singing, is worship. Not to find as you may define it, Defined, my friend, as God defines it. For he inhabits the praise of his people, Psalm 22. His presence, in his presence is a fullness of joy. I had a youth group years ago. I was very green in ministry, just cut my teeth, didn't know anything about church. And this old ragtag broom they gave me to hold youth services in. We began to pray. We had this thing called a war room. It's a room across from my office. And they stacked chairs and tables and such in there. It was kind of extra room. And I said, to, you know, I didn't have any authority. I was just a green old first week youth pastor thinking he's going to conquer the world. So I said to the operations people, first of all, I introduced myself. And I said, hey, do you think we could take this stuff out of this room here? and put it somewhere else, we gotta use this room. I think we could use this room. And lo and behold, they did it, I was amazed. And I took this sign, I found something on the internet, and printed off a picture, and it said war room on it. Put it up there. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, I invited old ladies. I was big on inviting old ladies. I'd go to the worship service, and I would watch people worship. And I looked for the people who had something in their eye that was different than the other people around, and they had lost themselves in abandonment to worship. It was earnest. It was in spirit and in truth. And I'd asked them to meet with me. And I said, well, first of all, I just wanted to get to know you, and I would say that your witness as a worshiper has led me as a new youth pastor to, to come to the understanding that I have absolutely no idea what, I do, what I'm doing, and that's actually an advantage. 
I said, I've never been to a youth group, but yet I'm the youth pastor. I've never been to a church before. This is the first church I've ever been to, and I have no idea how to do this. And I consider that my greatest asset because I'm gonna ask you to become my personal intercessor. I'm gonna ask you to go home and worship the Lord and pray and come back to me in two or three weeks and tell me if you'll be that person for me that I can call anytime, day or night, and you pray over me and my ministry. Will you consider that? Without fail, every one of them came back. The people who worshiped the most came back and said, yes, we'll do that. And they started meeting in that, that goofy old war room around three o'clock in the afternoon. And they started leaving around five, 5.30, six o'clock. That little ragtag youth group grew and grew and grew to the point where we couldn't find a retreat to go to often enough because those kids wanted to do nothing but worship and worship and worship and worship. In the back of a 10 past, 15 passenger van, I'd look in the rear view mirror and they were huddled in the back praying together on the way home and came to me at the front of the van and said, when we get back, do you think we'll be back at church early enough to have a worship service before our parents pick us up? That was the biggest problem I had with that group. They wanted to worship. And when they did, oh my goodness, it was unbelievable. We were at Camp Greenville outside of Brevard. Little did I know at the time I'd be living down the road. And we'd have a fire going in the fireplace in this lodge. We'd be in our, probably our second hour of worship. The fire had gone, gone out. But whenever we sang a song about the fire of God, the fire would light up. Man, they loved that. They would go, oh my gosh, look, Pastor, Pastor Gary, the fire's lit. And I said, well, yeah, we just sing about it. You know, I didn't know any better. I said, it sounds good to me. We were at a camp one time at Lake Fontana here in North Carolina, and a young girl, bless her heart, was made to go to camp. And it was the first camp I ever been to. And someone came to me, we were only there a couple hours, and said, so-and-so selling marijuana out of her room. I said, what? Yeah, so-and-so selling marijuana. She has a shoebox and she's making change. I thought, well, okay. So, she was new, I didn't know what was going on. I said, all right, well go into a room and get all the marijuana, would you? And don't tell her you have it. And then at dinner time, we'll have a worship service and then we'll figure out what to do after that. That was my way of saying, it. I have no idea what to do. We'll figure it out later. So we did and we came to this worship service directly from dinner. She had no idea we had been in her room. And we started to worship and sing and sing and sing. And we moved beyond the flesh and the emotion, and then we got, into, we got into the presence. And we stopped, and one kid goes, I just have a confession. He says, I hate my father. He had his younger brother there with him. He goes, I hate my father. He left us when we were two, and I need to forgive him. We had another kid who said, you know, I'm doing things I don't need to be doing, and I need to confess it. And marijuana girl said, sleeping with my boyfriend, I don't want to be here, and I'm selling marijuana out of my room. And I'm going inside, I'm going, hallelujah. <laughs> 15 minutes went by, and half that youth group went back to their rooms and brought back cigarettes, T-shirts, and what was supposed to be marijuana, realized we already had it, put it in the middle of the group. Now, I hadn't been on the job two weeks now. They put it in the middle of the room. They left it there, went back to worship. And four years later, that same youth group hosted 4,000 teenagers at Stone Mountain Park, developed their own television commercial, and had a worship service with bands from around the country and stood in the middle of those kids and worshiped God in spirit and in truth. Part, some of them are in China now as missionaries. Others of them are pastoring churches in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh area. Some of them are worship leaders. They tapped into the power of worship. It wasn't a spoken word as much as it was an encounter with God that lasted them their entire life. You could never argue that away from them. You could never debate that away from them. There was no apologetic that was gonna talk them out of the experience they had in an encounter with the presence of the Holy Spirit. That was it. You could wake them up at two o'clock in the morning tonight and ask them about that experience and they'll tell you that was one of the richest times of their life when they lost themselves yet found themselves in a lostness and a freedom of singing to the Lord. 
It's one of the most special things I've ever seen. It was a spiritually charged atmosphere on the heels and the coattails of a bunch of old blue-haired women who prayed the paint off the wall. Now, I say all that to say this. If you've ever been to another country like India, Thailand, or someplace where there is a, a great concentration of false religions, there, there is a spiritually charged, potent atmosphere of evil. And you can see it manifested in poverty, in oppression, and wicked governments that rip people off. That's the common theme. Well, when you get enough people praying together and seeking the Lord, and you get enough people worshiping him in the same place, you get a very spiritually charged atmosphere of holiness. Holiness. Well, that's what this youth group had. Now, before we start talk about heart to herald angels sing, I want to tell a testimony that I had one time in this spiritually charged atmosphere. It's about six o'clock at night, about to head home. I walk down the hallway of my office, walk towards the gymnasium. Place is empty. I'm the last one to leave. Across the gymnasium is a figure of a man. Long hair, slightly bearded, standing there. And he's doing something very unusual. I didn't realize it at the time, but there was something odd at the time. I didn't quite pick up on it. He's leaning in the door jam like this. I never saw anybody do that before. He's almost on to 45. And as I'm walking out of the gym, never saw this man before in my life. As I'm walking out of the gymnasium to go to my car, he said something to me. Very odd. Did things go as you expected today? I didn't think anything ever. I said, yeah, hey, cool, I'm out of here. Got my car, and I went home. Now, <clears throat> I went to bed, and deep down in the middle of the night, I woke up straight up out of bed like this. In a moment of acuity, I mean, I was just... Acute, I was awake, very sensitive to what was going on. And you ever hear that still small voice inside of you? Here's what it said. I sent you an angel today. I was like, what? I was like this, what, what? And I thought, that is so bizarre. That I, and, I, and immediately that thought came to me. You entertain angels unaware. Every one of us have entertained angels. You just don't know it. Hebrews 13 and 2. This was bizarre to me. I didn't really, I, at first I didn't believe it. I said, like, what do you think it is? What was that? Was that the pizza? What was that? What was that? And I just kind of didn't tell anybody. I just kind of sat on it. I said, man, that's bizarre. That's really weird. That's out of the ordinary for God and my relationship with God. That was really weird to me. So Wednesday night came for youth group. And we finished our worship experience and all the parents are picking up their kids and yada, yada. And I'm walking into the building, having talked to a parent. I'm walking into the building and oh my goodness gracious, here comes this figure of a man. Oh my gosh. I had all conflicting thoughts. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? This is weird. You are crazy is what I'm thinking. He walks towards me and I walk towards him and I'll be darned if he doesn't wink at me, this guy winks at me. With one of these grins on his face like, yeah, you know what, what's up? And I thought, and I'm, I'm concerned about people I've never seen before in, around children anyway. I'm thinking, what? Is, that is just bizarre. And I don't usually go here with stuff like this. So he passed me and I passed him and I was like, oh man, I gotta do something about this. So he got to the parking lot and I went out to follow him. Angie was putting the kids in the car seat at the time in a minivan we had. And I followed this guy. Now he was about 30 yards ahead of me and I kept walking and walking and walking. He went down over a hill. Four, four seconds before I did, he went over the hill. I went over to the top of the hill and looked down, and there was no one there. Gone. And I thought, well, good for you, Lord. You got my attention. Good for you. You don't rattle my cage. Good for you. What did I learn out of that experience? I learned that God is mindful of prayer, that God is encouraging in the midst of sustained seeking 
in prayer. I learned that we do entertain angels unaware. And I needed that right then and there in my young walk with Christ and my young walk in the ministry. I needed that little nudge to say, I see you. I, I see what you're doing here. I'm behind you. I'm for you. I'm with you. I am Emmanuel. No more than that. No hyper spiritual change to the whole direction of my ministry. No change the direction of my doctrine. Nothing like that. It was a personal nudge from God saying, yes. Yes, young man. Yes. You keep seeking, you keep praying, you keep pushing in, you keep ministering the word, and you're gonna see something among these kids. And I, I never forgot that to this day. And every time I hear this song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, I think of angels in heaven, I do. But I also think about the stranger that walks into the service in the middle of July you've never seen before, and you don't know where he came from. I do believe on some level that we do entertain angels underwear in this realm. I also believe that we entertain angels in the spiritual realm that we never see. That's the way I look at that scripture. I looked at it differently until I had that encounter. Hark the herald angels sing, Christmas and angels are inseparable. You've seen them at the, uh, you've seen them in It's a Wonderful Life. The last scene of It's a Wonderful Life, what are they talking about? Hark, what are they singing? Hark the herald angels sing. Charlie Brown even gets in on the act of Hark the herald angels sing. The whole Peanuts gang. In 1739, Charles Wesley, brother of John Wesley, came up from Savannah from England and wrote poems and hymns and songs. He wrote the song, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. He had a goofy name for it, so goofy it was called, Hark, How the Welkin Rings. It was so vile a title that George Whitfield changed it, rewrote the song, and then eventually in 1855, it got put to music. It was originally sung to the tune of Amazing Grace and Christ the Lord is Riven, Risen Today. That'll freak you out. Go home and try to sing this Hark the Herald Angels Sing to Amazing Grace. It'll get you all discombobulated. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild, God and Sinners Reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. And on it goes, hark the herald angels sing. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. I like the ending. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. I don't often do this, but I feel impressed enough to do it as I've prepared these messages to reiterate again, I cannot tell you how important it is for a man, a woman, a teenager to find that personal place of worship where it's you and him, you and the Trinity, you and a song, you in an intimate, abandoned, no self-consciousness, singing and maybe even dancing before the Lord. It's all scriptural. I think God welcomes, I think he beckons, I think he, he thirsts, I think he's parched for, for personal, intimate song. There's something about singing. The angels can't stop singing in heaven. That's what they do. And you know, from our vantage point, I say to myself, man, wow, don't they ever break it up, do anything a little different? No, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who reigns in all the earth, on and on and on and on. There's something about the visual of the throne in Revelation 4 that precipitates in somebody nothing they can say, nothing they can do that trumps and triumphs like singing. There's, I think singing exists at a level that we have to do it because we could not do it if we actually knew who we were singing to. I think there's a place you can go, should go, scripturally should go to sing before God. And I think the absence of the singing before God, as I look at my life, I go through seasons of the absence of singing to God and I see times of distress, confusion, uneasiness, or worse yet, my control, my will, my emotions, my thoughts, my opinions. There's something about singing to God in earnest that divorces oneself from personal lordship, personal control, personal manipulation. It is the, the, the acknowledgement of God for who he is and puts us in right position to him. 
And if we do that often enough in earnest and sing to him and celebrate him in a personal, intimate way, it translates and manifests itself in our life where there are situations we no longer want to control, but we yield to his will. We no longer want to manipulate, but we let him work it out no matter how it ends. There is something rooted in that personal worship, and you say, well, I don't do that. Yeah, how's that working out? How's that working out? How is it working out to take an entire section of the Bible, rip it out of the binding, and put it on a coffee table and say, I'm not going to read it because I'm not going to do it? How's that working out? It does not work out for me. And suddenly there, Luke 2, suddenly there was an angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Psalm 104, 33, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Does it say I'll sing because I'm a good singer? No. Does it say it's sing because I, because I have time to sing? No. Does it say sing because that's my vocation? No. It says I will sing. We all sing. Sing to your God in your personal worship times. Again, reading, rehearsing, and requesting will take you so far. Now, if this congregation would sequester themselves to their prayer closet, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from his wicked ways, then will he hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. We've done the same thing over and over and expect different results. One thing we haven't done is put every request aside and just worship the Lord. Just worship the Lord. I saw enough teenagers worship on a regular basis, sing songs of worship, write songs of worship. I saw kids that were on acid get saved. I saw kids you'd never think would ever enter a church called into ministry. I saw kids who couldn't stand their parents and wanted to kill themselves, and I had to sit down with their parents and said they threatened suicide. Living for Christ today because of a, an abandonment to worship. Some people don't attend church like, you know, Hebrews 10.25, don't forsake the assembly as some are in the habit of doing. I'll tell you why people don't attend church. Not because there's anything wrong with the church. Sometimes it's boring and sometimes the guy, the guy speaking stinks and sometimes it's just a bunch of rude people. But for the most part, the reason people don't attend church is because they don't worship. They have no reason to come to worship because they haven't worshiped at all. What's the, what's the purpose? There's no practice, there's no lead up, there's no celebration, nothing to celebrate. You have nothing to celebrate, that's why you're not in church. Churches and pastors begging people to come to church. Wrong song, dude. Get people to worship. You worship God Monday through Saturday, you can't be anywhere else on a Sunday morning but in the house of God with people to celebrate. That's the way it works, man. That's it. Worship. That's why I say, teenagers, listen, man. If you could find that place now, your spiritual IRA account, when you make those deposits now, will be in the billions when you're older. That's what it's all about. Do you know how difficult it is to take a 70-year-old man who's been to church this whole year and tell him about the Holy Spirit and get him to worship on his own? It's next to impossible. That, that man is stuck. You will not move me, I do it this way. I'm this, I'm that, great. But the soft-hearted, supple-hearted teenager who leaves room to consider something different and new, that has a pair of headphones and an iPod and some spare time on their hands, you can change the world with that person. You can change the world. You can change their world and the world of those around them. First Corinthians 14 and 15, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my spirit, he says, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. How does Jesus want to be loved? With all your heart. All your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. 
Don't come limited in your arsenal of worship. If it's awkward, it's probably the right thing to do. If it's new, it's not necessarily wrong. The angels who are around God constantly, constantly around him, more than anyone else in his presence, can't help but sing. This tells me something. He is more grand, more incredible, more wonderful, more inexplicable, undescribable than we can even imagine, Ephesians 3 and 20. He can do more than we can ask or even think possible, even imagine. I find it difficult to say no to worshiping him. Men, you want to grow in Christ? Fall on your knees and sing. You want to fall deeper in love with him? Fall on your knees and serenade him. You want to fall more deeply in love with your wife? Fall on your knees and serenade him. You want a, a tender, gentle heart towards your family? Fall on your knees and sing to him. You want freedom and liberty? Insight, direction, calling, compassion, giftedness, purpose, resolve? Fall on your knees and worship him. And do it in your bedroom, do it in your automobile. And then you come here on a Sunday morning and you take the culmination of all that celebration and you bring it in here. We'll join with the angels. They may even be in the room and we'll sing with them. This is the key that unlocks the door to a deeper understanding that comprehends how high, wide, long, and deep is the love of Christ. Let's